My name is Liran Khemovic, and I'm a co-founder and CTO at Rookout. Today, I'll be speaking with you about understanding Python's debugging internal, and it's great being here at PyBay and giving a talk. So, I am co-founder and CTO at Rookout, uh, and think as a manager, I care a lot about how can we deliver software, deliver it at scale, deliver it fast, and meet business goals. And as an engineer, I love to learn how software actually works, how computers work, and how does it all come together and combine. This is kind of what brought me to found, found Rookout. Rookout is a data collection and pipelining platform. We essentially allow you to collect any piece of data you want from your software while it's running without having to write any more code, redeploy or restart it. Just click on the line and get the data. Now, that might sound a bit abstract. So here's what it looks like. Click on the line. This is a Flask application that's running a, in a cloud. And when, once you invoke it, you get the data at the bottom. And you can see the local variables and the stack trace and so on. Now, I'm not going to talk much more about Rookout now. Uh, if you want, you can come by later and ask me about it. What I want to talk to you today is how we built it. How did we make something like that possible, a debugger that can work in production? So what do you think would be the challenges of making this possible? How, what are the hurdles we have to overcome? So first of all, we have to be able to do remote data collection. We want to access a, an application running somewhere in the world and collect data from it. We also want this to be non-breaking. If we want this to be able to work in production, we can't have a breakpoint stop the application. Uh, we want the data to be collected while the application continues running. Uh, we want to make sure we have no correctness or stability impact. The application has a job to do. And ask want it to get a piece of data from it can't come at a price for that. And we have to make sure the performance overhead is negligible. So how did we go about implementing it? We started out by learning about some of the Python debuggers out there. I'm not sure what's your favorite debugger, but some of the more popular ones include the PDB, which is part of the Python standard library. Uh, just letting you know, the slides will be available online. Feel free to take pictures, but uh, they'll, be, they'll be available online later. I know Grace is taking care of that. So, there's the PyDev debugger, which is an open source debugger used by both PyCharm and Eclipse. And other Python IDs such as IDLE, Atom, even a IPython, each of their own debugger. Uh, what most of those debuggers have in common, virtually all Python debuggers are built on top of this simple function. I wouldn't call it simple, but sysctrace just might be the most complicated function in the Python standard library. And this is the docs for it. It's a screenshot from the Python 2 docs. And I'm just going to walk you through it step by step so that you can understand what the hell it means. So what does sysctrace do? Using sysctrace, you register a callback for the interpreter. And this callback will be invoked in one of four events. Whenever a function is called, whenever a line is executed, whenever the interpreter executes a return, from a function, and whenever an exception is raised. On each of those four events, the interpreter is going to invoke us. Let's take a look at a simple uh, trace function. Function simple tracer received three arguments. Frame, which is a our window into the interpreter. It shows the state of the interpreter just as the function was called. The event, which is a string, either call, line, return, or exception and arg, which provides additional argument about the event that just happened. The function starts by extracting the function name and line number from the frame, and then it prints the event, function name, and line number. Finally, the function returns itself, which we'll discuss in a bit. Now, let's take a look at what this looks against a simple sample code. So, we start by calling sysctrace, no output, a, no output. The first output is here. The function is called for the first time for a call event. Function name is A, line number is one. 
followed by a line event, same function, line number is two. We get a call event for function B and a line event for function B, followed by a return event and another return event. So that's what it looks like when you run this simple function against this simple piece of code. Now, as I've mentioned, this function returns itself at the end. As you would see most uh, trace, most debug functions, that's what they do, they return themselves. The reason to it is to do with the fact that sysctrace is in fact a bit more complicated than it first seems. There are two trace functions. When you call sysctrace, what you in fact do is that you register a global trace function. This global trace function will be called by the interpreter whenever a new, a new frame is created. Whenever a, new, whenever a function call happens in your thread, the interpreter is gonna execute the global trace function. That function is gonna return another function, which is the local trace function. The local trace function can only be set when a new frame is created, and it will be used to trace all the frame local events. So line, return, and exception will be called for the local trace function. If you're going to use, if you're gonna return none from the global uh, trace function, then the frame will have no local trace, and the local trace event will not be called. Uh, while in theory you could create two separate trace functions, the convention for most Python debuggers is just use a single one. I'm not entirely sure why, but that's what it looks like. Now, let's take a look at the same example. When we call C set trace, the global trace function is set. When we call A, the global trace function is invoked and its return value is used to set the local trace function for A. And when B is invoked, the same happens. We, we invoke the global trace function and it sets the local set function. Keep in mind that even though A is a local trace function, that's irrelevant. Once you do, you do a function call, it, you always invoke the global trace function. Now, how do you handle multi-threading? Threading, when you call sysctrace, you set a trace function for your own thread, for the currently active thread. There is no way to set the, th the trace function for a different thread. The way to do it is by calling thread, threading setrace, which will cause the threading module to call sysctrace on that, with that callback you've registered whenever a new thread is created. Now keep in mind, this should be called as early as possible, because as soon as threading has created a thread, you have no way to set a trace function for it. And if somebody is using a different threading module, such as the built-in thread, you are not gonna be able to trace it using this function. Now, when it comes to event loops, such as gevent or eventlet, uh, the global tracing will be shared among all the, th the, the go coroutines because from Python's perspective, there's only a single thread. So you don't have to worry about that and it's gonna work out of the box. So, if you've been following so far, you're probably thinking it's not gonna be so easy to build a debugger. Uh, a global trace function and a local trace function, you have to decide what to set and what to return. Luckily for us, there's a quick hack we can do to build a breakpoint debugger. And that's inheriting from BDB. As I've mentioned earlier, Python has a built-in debugger called PDB. It's based off BDB. BDB is the base debugger. It's part of the Python standard library. And it contains an EVE implementation for the sysctrace function, the, for, writing, for using it. So to build a debugger, we start out by inheriting from it. We write our constructor that starts by uh, initializing the base class. We create an empty breakpoints direct dictionary. And we call setrace which causes BDB to register its own trace function in the current thread. The next step is to add our set breakpoint function. All we have to do is get a fine name and a line number, give them to BDB, it's gonna take care of the heavy lifting for us, and just keep track that for this fine name and line number, we want to <laughs> register a method. And finally, we want to override user line. User line is a BDB function. It's not part of the sysset trace mechanism. And it's essentially called whenever BDB wants to inform us that the user line is about to be executed. Surprisingly enough, it's gonna call us even if we didn't set a breakpoint in some cases. So first of all, we start by checking 
was there a breakpoint or did you just call me for fun? If there is no breakpoint, just return. Then we get the file name and line number from the frame, look up which breakpoints we have on that location and execute them. This is fairly straightforward and it's the simplest way to build your own uh, breakpoints debugger. Now, as you remember I mentioned, we want this performance overhead here to be negligible. Maybe, I don't know, someone might say 1%, someone might say 5%, but it's definitely something we have to take care of and test. So how did we go about testing the performance of this uh, naive debugger? We've written two uh, test methods. One is the empty method, which does nothing but pass. And the second is simple method, which is simply 10 assignment statements. We are gonna run each of those methods 16 million times in a loop and average out how long does each invocation take. And we are gonna run four scenarios. First, without the debugger, just the vanilla Python, how long does it take? Second, we're gonna run with a debugger, but without setting any breakpoints, with a breakpoint in a different file, and with a breakpoint in the same file. Now, keep in mind, in all cases, we're not going to invoke any breakpoints. All we are measuring is the global overhead, not the pair breakpoint overhead. So, any idea what it looks like? Those are the horrible results we got from the naive implementation. Really. Uh, that's what, how fast Python is without us, and that's how long a single invocation takes. Once you start debugging, pretty, very, very bad. How can we go about optimizing it? So there are three main considerations we have to keep when we're trying to optimize this set trace. The first is to avoid, avoid local tracing as much as possible. Uh, there are many, many more local tracing events than there are global tracing events. And the, the smarter we can be about not tracing a specific function invocation, the cheaper it's going to be. Then we have to be, see how fast can we optimize those call events. How fast can we decide if we want to instrument a specific function or not? And we have to, in, to optimize the line events. How fast can we decide if there is a breakpoint in a specific line or not? So at this point we forked BDB. We've cleaned a lot of unused feature. We've optimized for hot code path. We simplified as much as we could. And we got to this performance. As you can see, we're getting closer to the vanilla performance in certain use cases. But once we start with global tracing, performance suffers significantly. How many of you are familiar with Cyton? So for those, Cyton is a compiler that takes Python code or code that's very similar to Python and compiles it to C code, which is then compiled into a Python native extension, which is interoperable with the original Python code. So you essentially can take an existing Python module, compile it with Cyton, and you've got a built-in replacement that's supposedly much, much faster. Once we've compiled uh, our BDB with Cyton and a few optimization, we got here. That's a pretty big improvement, it's about a uh, 30, 40% of what it used to cost. And still, you can see that what we are dealing with here is not very performance grade performance, a production grade performance. So at this stage, we took a step back and decided to see what we've learned so far. So Python BDB is very, very naive. It was never designed for production use and it's not gonna cut it. We can improve it a lot, but as we continue improving it, every additional improvements become ever harder, and we're quite far from where we want to be. So we decided to do a simple test. What if we, do a, what if we write an empty tracer? What if we write a trace function that does nothing without return itself? I mean, that's literally as fast as we can make it work. This is the performance impact of that. Again, that's not what we were hoping for. At this point, we took a step into the C Python source code and try to figure out why does tracing cost so much. So once you turn on tracing, C Python has to do a lot of extra work. Some of it has to do in, happens in Python, in our code, where we can more easily optimize, but some of it happens in C. For example, there is this call function called maybe call line trace, which is invoked after every instruction to decide whether or not to call our uh, trace function. All this extra work happening in C 
cannot be optimized without forking the interpreter. And that's not something we wanted to go, uh, go down because it would mean installing Rookout or any other debugger would be a very significant change to the environment and for our customers. So we had to take a step back and think about what we want to do. How can we make that magic I've shown you earlier possible? How many of you are familiar with the Python bytecode? So the Wikipedia definition of bytecode is a form of instruction set designed for efficient execution by software interpreter. Essentially, Python compiles our sources into its bytecode and then executes that. This is a very simple function we can use as a demonstration. Def multiply a, b, result equals a times b, return result. Any guesses what the bytecode for these functions look like? So that's the bytecode. To be frank, even I can't read that, but if we take the this module, it's gonna be a bit more readable for us. So this multiply function compiles into load fast a, load fast b, multiply a and b, store result, load result, and return value. As you can see, Python took our mostly human readable text file and built it into a string that's easy for it to use and execute. The interpreter essentially works in two stages. The first is compile. Take the string, the text file, the py file we've built in, and compile it into a bytecode, into that ugly string that is used for efficient machine execution. If you know those PYC files you're often seeing in directories, PYC is essentially caches of Python bytecode. Then the interpreter goes into the interpreter loop and starts executing those instructions in the loop. This is where tracing takes place. Whenever the, the, inter, the interpreter uh, encounters a traceworthy event, it creates a frame and invokes our trace function to let us know that something has happened. As you can imagine, this is a very expensive process. For every, for every instruction the interpreter is executing, Tracing is extra work, and that's where the performance overhead we've seen comes into play. What we do at Rookout is we do a different approach. We go to the bytecode in memory. We find the line of code that we want to set the breakpoint. So if we took main py line 12, we find main py line 12 in the application bytecode, and then we insert a breakpoint. Our breakpoint is essentially a calling structure. So the interpreter doesn't care about it. It executes the bytecode just as it used to. And when it encounters that calling structure, Rookout is invoked, and we can take a snapshot of the state and let the codex continue running. And this way, the interpreter doesn't care that we exist or that we are debugging or anything at all. Now, Bytecode manipulation is a pretty big topic, and I'm not gonna be able to dive into it too much today. Just to give you some resources about where you can learn more about it. There is the inspect module, uh, that's part of the Python standard library, and it's a very useful module that allows you to see what the interpreter is doing, and it's very easy to read and understand. There is the this module. The this module allows you to take those strings, those uh, bytecode strings, and uh, disassemble them or decompile them into somewhat more human readable format so that you can more easily understand it. Unfortunately, Python doesn't offer any way to change bytecode in memory. And if you want to do that, you have to write a native extension that will access the C APIs and do it for you. And if you want to take, go down that route, then Google has an open source project called Cloud Debug Python, which has some resources on it. And so far, we've been talking about what do you do uh, until you break. How do you know when to break? How do you cause the interpreter to break? But what do you do after you break? So as we've mentioned, the first argument to the trace function is frame. 
And frame is literally the state of the interpreter, just as your function is called. And using frame, you can see the stack trace, you can see local variable values, you can see anything you want about the state of the current application. The inspect module, which I've mentioned, is well documented and very easy to use. It allows you to get a function's bytecode, to get variable states, to get anything you want. And unlike what I've shown you previously, performance here is very, very good because everything we're doing here is very similar to how the interpreter works internally so that you can just uh, do it with virtually no performance over it. For example, check out this function, test frame info. The first argument here is frame, uh, sorry. The first statement, we take the frame using inspect coin frame. Now, inspect coin frame is probably one of the most useful functions in inspect, and it's useful for a few reasons. The first reason is that if you just want, want to explore, to learn more about the Python interpreter, about how it works, about the inspect module, inspect coin frame gives you the coin frame. So if you are wondering how something looks like in Python, all you have to do is write a function that makes it happen, call inspect coin frame, and you've just gotten a frame that shows your test case. This is also very useful for unit testing, features regarding the inspect module. And finally, you can also use inspect coin frame in production, and we're gonna cover that in a bit. What this function prints is the get frame info of the inspect module for the coin frame. And this is what it looks like. You get a file name, the line number, you get a function name and the current source line, as well as the index of the frame. Frames are a stack, and current frame is the top of the stack, which we are currently executing. If you go from the current frame to the next frame, you're essentially walking up the stack. So you'll see index goes one, two, three, et cetera, as you're walking up the stack and seeing the caller stack, who called you, and so on. And here's another example for local variables. My STI is a string. My dict is a dictionary. My list is a list. And down here we print F locals of the current frame. F locals is a reference to the locals you have. Any idea what it's going to look like once we print it? So locals in Python are essentially a dictionary. It's implemented in a Python dictionary just like the ones you're used to using. So that's what you're seeing. My dict is the dictionary. My str is a string. My list is a list, and all of it is contained within a dictionary where the keys are the variable names and the values are the variable values. Uh, any thoughts what you can do this for? What you can use of this technology for? So obviously you can show off your Python skills. That's very important. We're here at PyBay and everybody here is an awesome Python developer. But there are a few other real use cases for that. For instance, have you ever wondered how does the logging module know which file name and line number you called it from? What the logging module does is call inspect current frame, and then it walks up the frame, walks up the stack to find the first frame that contains sources not from the logging module. And that's the caller. That's your function that is called logging info. You can use it to walk up the stack to get variable values and other information and you can obviously build a debugger. Now, all the resources from this talk are also available here at PyCon Debugging Internals, and uh, that's it. Uh, I would love to hear any questions you have or any thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. There are a lot of differences. Uh, Why did you choose the bytecode is more stable and easily, more easily accessible. Uh, for a, well, AST is definitely a significant part in any compiler. In the Python realms, it's not as well documented, it's not as accessible API-wise, it's not 
let's say, a first-class citizen, while the Python bytecode is much more integral part of the language. It's more accessible using the C APIs. It's, it's very stable between versions. It's, in Python, the AST, I would say, is more of an implementation detail, while the bytecode is a more integral part of the standard than the API. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't go too deep into what optimization we've tried, but essentially what happens is that, as I've mentioned, you want to make a, to local trace as little as possible, and some of the conditions we've tr experimented with to local trace, for instance, in BDB, the naive implementation just says if it's in the, this file. Uh, if you have a breakpoint in this file, local trace. If there, is, if there are no breakpoints in this file, don't local trace. So that was the naive BDB implementation, which is why we've included this test case as part of our suit. At certain points, we've tried smarter optimization. For instance, we've enumerated the function line numbers, and we've only instrumented it if there is a breakpoint within the function. But those various use cases were all around whether or not to turn on local tracing for the specific function. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.